Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming back to uh, Historic Oakwood Cemetery for another one of our virtual tours. I think this is number 10. Uh, if you've been with us before, you may remember a tour we did some time ago about uh, schools in Raleigh with uh, uh, the names of folks who were, who were interred out here. And following that, we had several requests from folks who would like us to do the same sort of thing for higher education in part because we have so many people out here who are directly associated with our area universities. Um, so that's what we're going to do today and we're going to start with the University of, Chapel, uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill uh, if for no other reason than that that was the first uh, state university in the country so it seemed a logical one to begin with here. Uh, now. Um, Full disclosure requires that I let you know that mine is a Carolina family. Uh, I went to graduate school there, my wife got a degree there, my son did too. Um, however, I, we, we are absolutely unbiased and that's a promise that I think I may be able to keep, but maybe not. Um, Robin Simonton is our uh, distinguished filmographer here. Uh, she's the executive director of Oakwood, many of you know her. Uh, she uh, went to the University of Hawaii and you'll get neutrality there because the University of Hawaii is not known as a tobacco road rival of uh, UNC Chapel Hill. So we're going to do other schools following this. Uh, uh, our next school will surely be uh, <clears throat> a local school here in Raleigh, NC State. Um, as well as other schools later on, but uh, today, as the old song, as the old song says, we gather at the well. So come with us on this beautiful day. All right, we thought a logical place to start would be with uh, a founder of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And as far as we know, the only member of the first board of trustees, who I think collectively could be called the founders of the university, is uh, a fellow named John Haywood, who many of you know already. Uh, he's well known in Raleigh uh, for at least three things. Uh, he was the state treasurer for some 40 years. He um, was the first mayor of Raleigh, though they didn't use that term at the time. And he, in 1799, uh, built Haywood Hall, which to this day is the oldest building in Raleigh that hasn't been moved. So he's quite attached to this city, but was also quite attached to the university as a member of that first board. And as a member of the board, uh, hang on just a second, we have some graphics for you. Here is a picture of, uh, of John Haywood. In fact, we have pictures of most of the people that we talk about today, uh, in part so you don't have to look at me all morning, and in part so that I don't have to powder my wig. But um, anyway, as a member of the board, he was a member of two committees of the Board of Trustees, one location, which means he was probably one of those half dozen men on horseback who rode around the area of what was then um, the Good Hope Chapel, which became Chapel Hill um, in uh, the 1790s, the early 1790s. And he was also a member of the Food or Menu Committee of the Board of Trustees, who recommended that the university serve uh, a dinner, which I think in those days was a late uh, afternoon meal, and they offer either uh, bacon and greens or beef and turnips. That was to be the menu, which may explain why the first student at the University of Chapel Hill, that is Hinton James, didn't show up to the school for a month after it opened in uh, 1795. Perhaps he'd seen an advanced copy of that menu. Now, through the wonders of virtual touring, we have moved quickly from the uh, Hex section of the cemetery to the Johnson section. Uh, Oakwood Cemetery has two former presidents of the University of North Carolina, in fact, two consecutive presidents. Um, 
And the first that we're visiting now, just off of Chapel Circle, is uh, David Swain. Uh, David Swain from the uh, mountains, a legislator, a three-term governor of North Carolina in the early 1830s when the terms were much shorter than they are now. Uh, well known to the people of North Carolina, Swain County out in the mountains is named for him. But what most people don't know is that David Swain actually attended as a student at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, for one week. How did that happen? He came down attending to go to school there. He didn't like it. He didn't like the school and it didn't seem to have the program that he wanted. He wanted to become an attorney. He thought he could do better by sitting at the feet of practicing attorneys, which is what he did. Um, he, uh, in, in 1835, he was appointed the president of the university. And I think his portrait is around that time. Here he is. To be honest, not known for good looks or social graces, but known for leadership skills, common sense, and for being very tall. I think he was something over six feet tall. But anyway, uh, uh, apparently, uh, obviously from his career, an impressive fellow. Uh, he was president of the university for some know, 35 years or so. Um, and he led it right through the Civil War. He kept it open in part because he arranged it so that students at the University of North Carolina would not be drafted. That is, they were exempt from being drafted in the Confederate Army, which meant he still had some students there to work with. <laughs> Otherwise, everybody would have gone. As it was, of course, many, many Chapel Hill students did go off and fight in the Civil War. After the war, tied up with uh, reconstruction politics and so forth. Not only that, the university was out of money, it was out of students, it didn't have much of a faculty left. They thought that um, President Swain was a little too pro-Yankee, uh, pro if you will. And in fact, uh, uh, he turned in his resignation in 1868 and soon thereafter died in a carriage wreck. Um, and the state closed the university in uh, 1871 and didn't reopen it for another four or five years. And it was turned over to another president. And we're going to meet him in just a minute. Anyway, David Swain, very important in the history of UNC Chapel Hill. And we've moved now to the uh, battle section a name for a Carolina family whom you've met, again, if you've been with us and we did the battle section. Um, uh, the battles produced another president of the University of North Carolina. We're standing at his marker here. This is the gravesite of Kemp Plummer Battle, a, a student at the university, graduated with the class of 1849, and he was the valedictorian. At UNC, he'd studied law under his father, who was a famed professor there. His father and mother are right next to him here in Oakwood Cemetery. She is the nearer marker. Uh, William Horn Battle is the taller one. Uh, and you can see that Kemp Battle was proud of his uh, various careers. Later on, after he retired as president of uh, the University of North Carolina. He became a historian, or he always was a historian, but he focused on it. And you see, he took great pride in being the president of his school. Uh, he took over when the university reopened uh, in uh, 1876, after um, he was the president following David Swain, whom you, whom you just met. And his job at the university, you might say, was to rebuild it, a very difficult job, which he did. Uh, I think he got sort of a, perhaps a, a, a grade of B on that. Um, he certainly focused on the, a, a great deal on the, his, the history part of the curriculum there. And afterwards, as we said, uh, published a number of historical works, including one, The History of the University of North Carolina. Also, if I haven't mentioned it, in his spare time, <laughs> he uh, was one of the founders of Oakwood Cemetery, too. So a man who certainly left uh, quite a legacy behind. Kent Plummer Battle. Let me show you his photo. Almost forgot. See, we've done away with uh, done away with the wigs by then. 
we've come uh, over to the Beechwood section now uh, to the gravesite of one Robert Watson Winston. Now he was not a president of the University of North Carolina, but his brother was. George Taylor Winston, who is not here in Oakwood, was Robert's brother, and he's the one who took over from Kent Plummer Battle uh, when Battle retired in the mid-1890s. Uh, and it was George Taylor Winston who was uh, president of UNC till uh, about the turn of the century, as I recall. Uh, Robert uh, Winston, though, made a name his, in his own right. He was one of the first students to return to campus when it reopened uh, uh, in uh, 1876. Um, he became an attorney and later a judge, and he always, through his whole life, was known as Judge Winston. And from his uh, photo portrait, it suggests that he was not a judge that you would want to argue with if he was on the other side of the bench. So, uh, but made such a name for himself that for the rest of his life he went by Judge Winston. And the amazing thing about uh, Robert Winston's story to me is that in his 60s, at 63 years old, he returned to Chapel Hill and signed in as a freshman and took the four-year course again at Chapel Hill. He lived at the Carolina Inn while he did it. When he finished, instead of taking up law again, he became a noted biographer uh, and wrote biographies of uh, Southerners primarily. Uh, Jefferson Davis, uh, Andrew Johnson, uh, Robert E. Lee, as well as at least one book about uh, the Old South. So a man with a broad career, um, if I can remember it, his bit of advice on how to live a good life, you should trust in doctors, doctors quiet, diet, and merry man. M-E-R-R-Y, merry man. Quiet, diet, and merry man, the secret to a happy and successful life. All right, Robin has shown you a little bit of the Magnolia Hill section where we are now, uh, where we're going to meet another jurist, much like Robert Winston, went to UNC, but Walter uh, Mackenzie Clark had a unique history as a student, I think. Uh, he was uh, a young man when the Civil War broke out, too young, in fact, to become a soldier in the regular army, so he joined the Junior Reserves. and. Um, he would go out and campaign or help train uh, Confederate troops during the war and then return to the university and then he'd go back out with troops and come back to school and continue his studies. Uh, it worked for him because he got an undergraduate degree uh, before 1865 and after the war he went back to UNC for a more normal program, I think, and got his uh, master's degree. Uh, he went into law, he became a jurist, and here is his photo. And as a uh, uh, Supreme Court justice, he would be very happy among today's, among folks who today's, today consider themselves progressives. He was a reforming judge. He was in support of uh, women's suffrage, of labor union organizations, uh, I believe to some degree he even advocated nationalizing uh, some utilities. He opposed the big trust, the tobacco trust, the railroad trust, and so forth. Uh, again, served for some 20 years in that capacity at the beginning of the last century. The other thing that he's well known for is promoting the state motto, esse quam videri, to be rather than to seem, um, which was adopted around the turn of the century. And uh, also the two dates that are on our state flags, uh, which represent North Carolina's early efforts to declare our independence from Britain. So Mackenzie Clark, a great contributor, not only to the, uh, with a strange history as a student, but uh, to his state uh, in later life. Uh, we've moved to the Briggs family uh, section of the cemetery, and we're in the Royster family plot. 
Uh, the Roysters, if you visited the cemetery, you've probably been here because the Royster family is one of the most popular in, uh, in Oakwood Cemetery. And uh, for two things, I suppose, a lot of people know their candy business in Raleigh, which lasted uh, almost 100 years or so, but especially their odd first names, named for States of the Union. For instance, right here, uh, Iowa, Michigan Royster, a Carolina man, as were many of the Roysters, uh, he was salutatorian in his class, which I believe was, well, uh, around uh, 1861, approximately. This is Wisconsin, Illinois Royster. Uh, you can barely read his stone, but associated with the, with the med school at the UNC. Uh, over here, meet Virginia, Carolina Royster, a stone very difficult to read. She married a Baptist preacher named James Howe, and he's buried next to her, and they had a son. Their son is right here, Edward Vernon Howe. I'm not sure Robin, as good as she is, can pick that up on her camera, uh, but his uh, claim to fame, as far as UNC goes, is right here on his stone. You can barely read it. It says, founder of the, founder and dean of the School of Pharmacy, at the University of North Carolina and gives his dates 1897 to 1931. Uh, founder may be a little too strong a word because the School of Pharmacy did exist before uh, Mr. Howe came along, but he's the man who gave it life, uh, who made it a lot more meaningful than it was at the time. And of course that school has developed into a worldwide renowned school for its uh, it's work in pharmacy. And here's a photo of the man a little later in life. Now, as a footnote to uh, Mr. Howell's career, in those days, we're talking about the 1890s now, uh, when he first came to uh, Carolina as both a graduate student as well as became dean of the pharmacy school, in those days, the football team could recruit grad students and faculty to play on the team. And Howell did and made a name for himself as a great football star in his day, one of the early Carolina uh, uh, athletic stars. So Edward Howell, uh, even though a Wake Forest undergraduate, made a meaningful contribution later in life to UNC. All right, we're way across the cemetery now in the Anderson section, uh, same family, a different Royster plot though. This is uh, the uh, family of Vermont, Connecticut Royster. He was the brother of, uh, of uh, Iowa, Michigan Royster, Arkansas, Delaware Royster, Wisconsin, Illinois, whom you met in the larger family plot over there in the Briggs section. Um, again, a Carolina family, but the, the uh, Tar Heel that we want to talk about here is behind his father's grave. This is Vermont, Connecticut Royster. The grandson of the Vermont Royster that you just met. Uh, Vermont Royster, did, as a young man, did in fact work in the candy store for a while. He went off to UNC. He was an editor of the Daily Tar Heel, which is not a surprise. Uh, after his time at UNC, he was a captain of a destroyer during World War II in the Pacific. Um, and then went to work for the Wall Street Journal, where he became not just a nationally known editor, uh, but an international figure. Uh, Vermont Royster, uh, you never heard his middle name, Vermont, Connecticut, um, but uh, Vermont Royster, an internationally known name with an opinion that mattered. People cared what the Vermont Royster said. Here's his picture. He was also the president of the Dow Jones Company, a, a financial information firm. And um, when he left the journal and Dow Jones, he came to Chapel Hill. And he was a professor of journalism there, a renowned professor of journalism. When he retired from that, he and his wife moved into Springmore, North Raleigh, and that's where he passed away. But uh, a man who uh, I suspect, and I may be exaggerating a bit here, but among the folks in Oakwood Cemetery, many of them nationally known here, but probably the one with one of the biggest international names would be Vermont, 
Loyster, UNC. All right, we're still in the Magnolia Hill section. Uh, you've met several great Carolina families, and here's another one. Uh, uh, an extraordinary Carolina family, to my mind anyway. The patriarch of the family, Robert Torelius Gray, uh, he went to UNC and became a, uh, a board member. Um, and uh, very important to the city of Raleigh, he promoted the introduction of streetcars and electricity in the 1880s. In fact, his grandson is the one who pulled the first switch that brought the electric light to downtown Raleigh in 1885. Now, his son, Robert Lilly Gray, um, went to Carolina Law, but he became a newspaper editor. He edited the Raleigh Times for many years, as well as some national magazines. Uh, but his wife uh, has a, 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 an extraordinary honor that won't ever be taken from her. She was the first female to enroll at UNC in 1897. Now, there may have been a family connection there because her dad was the dean of the uh, uh, Carolina Law School, James Cameron McRae, for 10 years. Um, and Mary and Robert had a daughter, Frances Gray. She went to UNC on a fellowship, uh, which enabled her to write plays. Uh, and that is said to have inspired her to become the writer that she did. Uh, she's been, you, you, in fact, we've talked about her before, you met her here before, called the Jane Austen of the South, a short story writer for national magazines like the New Yorker and Collier's and so forth, nationally known uh, writer. In a way, she sort of broke the chain. How? She married Lewis Patton. He was a dookie. He taught English there. So, but anyway, a rather extraordinary family, I think, and uh, uh, certainly... Uh, a family that Carolina can be proud of. Uh, you've uh, just heard about Mary uh, McRae Gray uh, introducing women, if you will, to the Carolina campus in 1897. And uh, we're going to talk about another undergraduate the female at UNC. This is Annie Louise Wilkerson, a name that a lot of you know already. Um, she was born in Apex to a country doctor, who's uh, remembered right next to her, Charles Wilkerson, and he made house calls, and while he was traveling around a rural Way County, Annie would often go with him, and I gather assist, if not do some birthing herself. Uh, so she was well familiar with the uh, medical field. She uh, went to Duke for a time, and then she transferred to Carolina and she got a Bachelor of Science in Medicine at Carolina, but she couldn't go to medical school there. Why? Because she was female and North Carolina uh, Medical School was not taking female uh, students. So she had to go and get her uh, 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 medical degree from the Medical College of Virginia across the border. But she came back to Raleigh and over time she became the chief of staff at Rex Hospital, the chief of staff at uh, Wake Hospital, and it is said that she may have birthed as many as 8,000 babies as an OBGYN. Uh, in fact, on some of our walking tours, when we have a crowd of people and we stop here and talk about Annie, we always ask, anybody here birthed by Annie? And it is not unusual at all. In fact, I'd say more often than not, we get a hand or two raised and they may say, oh, well, I was, Annie was uh, birthed uh, me or a good friend of mine, not me, but a good friend. So uh, again, she was so involved with uh, so many family lives here in Raleigh. When she passed away, she left what was said to be the most generous gift ever given to Wake County. That is her rural retreat at the north end of the county, which is still a, a, a preserve. Um, Annie Louise Wilkerson, again, a credit to Carolina. I, uh, I have a picture over here, and I'm sorry I'm not better organized, but here she is hard at work. Married to medicine, she said. She wore pearls all the time. 
unless she was uh, operating or birthing. Here she is without pearls, hard at work. We've moved to uh, the Creekside section of the cemetery. In fact, we're right behind the office. And uh, you met one of our early North Carolina governors with David Swain, and we thought we might uh, bookend him a bit with uh, the latest governor to be buried, and the most recent, I should say, governor to be buried in Oakwood Cemetery, Daniel Killian Moore. Um, must have been a modest fellow. In fact, I'm sure he was. Look at his stone, nothing glamorous about it, but uh, as certainly a man who made his contributions to the state of North Carolina. Uh, he was known as the Mountain Man. He came from the mountains, the Asheville and Silva area, and uh, went to UNC undergraduate and UNC law in the 1920s uh, uh, with the U.S. Army during the Second World War. Afterwards became part of the uh, North Carolina uh, court system left it for a time to go into private business, came back to it, in and out of North Carolina uh, courts. Uh, elected governor in 1965, a, a moderate, a Democrat, but one I think who was respected by both sides of the aisle. Uh, and the thing in terms of UNC anyway that he's best remembered for, uh, unhappily perhaps, was the speaker ban law. Uh, the speaker ban put um, uh, controls on particularly left-wing speakers uh, in the University of North Carolina system, uh, and it became very controversial, odd uh, given today's uh, events. But uh, at any rate, Dan Moore, I think, worked his way through that as best he could, uh, dealing with a law that was eventually declared unconstitutional. Um, if, you, if Robin, our uh, talented filmographer, wants to come around, You'll see, though, I think what he was really proud of. Here's his record on his uh, stone, and uh, it cites his governorship from 1965 to 69, and then two terms with the North Carolina uh, court system. And I think that's really where, uh, if he had a choice, that would be where he would make his historic mark. Uh, but again, another Tar Heel who contributed mightily to his state, and we're glad, happy to have him here in Oakland. All right, well, we've gathered round the well, as the song says today, so it's very appropriate that we should end with uh, a visit to George Young Ragsdale from uh, nearby Johnston County. He went to UNC, class of 1923. And uh, while he was there, very active. He was a class officer, fraternity man, uh, uh, worked with the Daily Tar Heel, uh, just like uh, other people that you've met, like Vermont Royster. Um, but what he will be best known for always, I think, is winning a contest at UNC by writing, along with some friends of his, uh, the Carolina Fight Song. Uh, uh, in fact, so well known as he, even though it's a little, I hesitate a little because it is a bit controversial. Other people claim to have written it, but I think the credit certainly goes to George Young Ragsdale. And at his funeral in uh, 1990, uh, apparently at the uh, Chapel Hill, on the Chapel Hill Bells, they played his fight song on the day of his funeral, perhaps as the funeral was going on. So I think that's a pretty good endorsement of, uh, of, of his fight song. So it's fight, fight, fight for Carolina, as Davy did in days of old. And even though we may not have a Governor Davy, uh, the man who's give, given most credit for, uh, for implementing um, uh, the uh, University of North Carolina. Um, even though we don't have Davy with us here in Oakwood, as I hope you've seen today, we have many folks over the years who benefited from his contributions and uh, who have contributed a great deal to their city and to their state. We're happy to have them with us. And believe me, that's just a fraction of, of, um, of the Carolina folks that we have here. Lots of folks from other schools 
and some of the Carolina people, the oldest uh, public university in the country, helped to get some of those schools started too, including another important, very important state school right here in Raleigh. And we're going to be dealing with that very soon. Stay tuned. Great thanks to Robin Simonton again, our director and videographer, and to Michael Palco, who is our editor, who will be looking at this and uh, making sure it's presentable to you. So, thank you. Thank you for watching.